<laughs> right, let me just briefly summarize what, what I think uh, the, the problem is, or the core of the problem is. So we've got, I think, three, three uh, inconsistent um, observations we can make. So the first observation is that it appears to be the case that uh, Nagarjuna had a set of definitely stated doctrines, for example, that everything is empty, including emptiness, that emptiness is to be spelled out in terms of dependent origination, that realizing emptiness leads to the cessation of suffering and so on. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that it appears to be that Nagarjuna produced a systematically arranged set of arguments for these positions. And that is primarily what I'm referring to is what we find in the so-called Yukti quest. Right, okay, so that's the second point. Now, point number three is how do we square these first two points with assertions like we find, for example, in Yukti Shastika 5051, where Nagarjuna says, the great souled ones have neither thesis, paksha, nor contention, vivada. How can there be an opposing thesis, para paksha, for those who have no thesis? And 51, by taking any standpoint whatsoever, one is attacked by the twisting snakes of passion. But those whose mind, chitta, has no standpoint, stana, those are not caught. Right, okay, so this is the, this is the problem, I think, which is at the, at the heart of the whole issue, and that's what we want to explain. Now, um, when I, when I thought about this matter, I, I uh, uh, thought again of a, a very interesting um, quotation which uh, David Ruick uses when he opens his uh, book on the literature of the Madhyamaka school. Um, so let me just read to you what he says there. He says, over the half past century, the doctrine of Madhyamaka school, and in particular that of Nagarjuna, has been variously described as nihilism, monism, irrationalism, mythology, agnosticism, skepticism, Criticism, dialectic, mysticism, acosmism, absolutism, relativism, nominalism, and linguistic analysis with therapeutic value. <laughs> <laughs> now, and then, then he says, okay, the first five of those, nihilism, monism, irrationalism, mythology, and agnosticism, are hardly appropriate in any context and quite misleading when taken in their usual senses. So, um, for those of you like me who don't know what mythology is, I looked it up. It, what it may, means here is the hatred of reason or the disdain of reason. So I think most relevant in, in the present context here are irrationalism and mythology, what we're talking about. Um, now, I, I think the discussion can actually benefit from the introduction of one more ism, which hasn't been, managed, uh, hasn't been mentioned in this list, and that is anti-foundationalism. And so I would like to focus in my discussion on the meaning and relations of two key terms. One is the term rationalism and irrationalism, and the second is the term foundationalism and anti-foundationalism. Okay, so first of all, rationalism. Now, um, <coughs> I'm, I'm just going to do some defining here, and um, uh, <coughs> what, what I take rationalism to mean and how we should really understand it in this debate. And uh, I think we should understand it as the belief that there are certain intersubjectively determinable features, IDFs, of statements such that if a statement we hold to be true has these features, then another a different statement is also true. So a simple example, if A is true and if, if A then B is true, then B is also true. Now if we have this very, very liberal um, view of rationalism, that rationalism being a thesis, that they are these intersubjectively determinable features of statements, then uh, first of all, we haven't said anything about translatability into symbolic notation, so completely um, agnostic on that. And secondly, we haven't said anything about the status of these intersubjectively determinable features. So we, um, I, we might also want to call them logical rules, right? I'm just being a bit careful about that term here, or logical laws. So, but we haven't said whether these logical laws are reflections of reality at the deepest level, or whether they're psychological necessities, or whether they are um, roots that appear necessary to us because of us having the kind of brain we have, of kind of our evolutionary history, or whether we, they are a game we made up, all of that is completely, we can, can be completely agnostic about that while still holding on to this definition of rationalism. Now, it therefore follows that being a rationalist in this very general sense does not commit us, um, and I'm quoting Sandy here, to the compulsive search for objective rational certainty. Um, because such certainty, I, I presume, are, are the positions Nagarjuna rejects in Yukti Shastika 51 and elsewhere. Um, 
And this is the case because rationalism thus understood does not entail foundationalism, even though it uh, is entailed by some forms of foundationalism. Now, when I say foundationalism, what I mean when talking about Nagarjuna is it's primarily two sorts of foundationalism. There is ontological foundationalism and there is epistemological foundationalism. So ontological foundationalism is the idea that there are some objects such that they don't depend for their existence on other objects, which sometimes metaphysicians call substances, even though all other objects depend on them. And these would be the things which exist by Svobhava. So that's ontological foundationalism. Secondly, epistemic or epistemological foundationalism. Some epistemic instruments deliver truth by their very nature and if they are correctly applied. So their delivery of truth is not dependent on other epistemic instruments. And for example, if we are an epistemic foundationalist about reason, then rationalism is entailed. Now, Nagarjuna is uh, arguably an anti-foundationalist on both counts, but that does not make him an irrationalist, even not in the very weak sense I've defined rationalism and irrationalism to be here, because um, uh, rationalism does not entail foundationalism. Now, I want to um, um, just briefly mention one very interesting quotation from Sandy's paper, um, where he says that here is where the road forks. One way leads towards the promise of true, rationally binding conclusions, the other to a state of non-abiding, a metaphysical place, uh, sorry, a metaphorical place, neither on nor off the map. Yeah, interesting slip. Um, of course, when we, when we say there is, a, there is a fork in the road, what, what you want to do as a Madhyamika is find the middle way. And uh, I, I think uh, that uh, this fork is imaginary, and in fact, there is a middle way here. And I think Sandy is, is right in saying that the Madhyamika position is not on the map of philosophical positions. So it is not that we could say, some say ultimately matter, some say ultimately mind, and Nagarjuna says ultimately emptiness, and that's it. So this, because this would mean to misunderstand the emptiness of emptiness. But it is, we, so even though Nagarjuna is not on the map, we can also say he's not off the map, uh, because um, some, we don't want to say that uh, Nagarjuna's position is some ineffable position uh, since the systems of conventions with, in, in which we formulate this convention also creates the very notion of a fact and of a philosophical position. So it's not the case that there are all the effable positions and then there are the ineffable, ineffable positions and Nagarjuna's is one of those. Uh, just to give you a sort of toy example, suppose somebody says, okay, I've d discovered a new um, chess opening and this chess opening is so subtle that you can't actually phrase it in the language of chess. Right? The thing. That's just weird. There, there can be no such thing. Similarly here, right? Um, it's it's the, the system of convention which creates the facts in the first place. So you, you don't want to say that the, the position of Nagarjuna is off the map. It's ineffable. Okay, so that is true. But it is also the, clay, the case that um, the truth of Nagarjuna's statements lies in the fact that it is an antidote against the grasping as at Svabhava. And here I agree with Sandy's claim that um, the cash value of truth is a strict function of its soteriological efficacy. But, but however, I don't think that this leads to relativism, that what is true for some persons is not true for others. Okay, so, it, so this is what the truth of the Madhyamika statements amounts to, that it is an antidote against grasping at Svabhava. And it is also rationally binding since its conclusions follow, we assume, if they're any good, the arguments, from premises we hold via the true IDFs, the inter, uh, intersubjectively determinable features, the laws of logic. Uh, and we are bound by these laws since they form part of the conventional reality that makes up samsara. So, and we can quote here, of course, um, Karukas 2410, without depending on the conventional truth, the meaning of ultimate uh, truth cannot be taught, and without understanding the meaning of the ultimate liberation is not achieved. So I, to that extent, I think we can, we can uh, strike a middle path here, and, and we can say, okay, it's both the case that the position is neither on nor off the map, and we can also say that it is both true and rationally binding. Now, I just want to finish with the, um, with the thought that <coughs> given this whole anti-foundationalist uh, idea of the, of the uh, Nagarjuna system, 
um, samsara as a network of convention is obviously not established from the outside by based on some sort of foundation that is outside of it but via some strange bootstrapping process that brings it itself into existence so um, well if, if that is the case if it's a sort of a self-generating system which doesn't rely on any outside foundation then it would also seem to be that the liberation from samsara and the destruction of systems of conventions also must be achieved from the inside so it must be dissolved from the inside by following its own rules and some of these rules some of the part of that network of conventions are what we call the laws of logic and um, <clears throat> i think there's uh, one um, verse of nagarjuna's which uh, sums that up very well and that is the uh, the first verse of the uh, chitta vajrastava where nagarjuna says I bow to my own mind that dispels mind's ignorance by eliminating the mind sprung web through this very mind itself. And uh, that's, uh, that's where I would like to conclude. Thank you.